Hello and welcome to your course on constitutional law. This is week one and we will be focusing this week on introducing you to two key concepts and key issues in the study of constitutional law. The concepts that we will look at are uh, what is a constitution, what is it that constitutions do and what are the key features of the Indian constitution. Now, we all are familiar with the constitution itself. We have some passing familiarity, either from our civics courses in school, or if we have had any exposure to, poli to political science or other social sciences, we have some familiarity with the, with, with the constitution. But sometimes it's very easy to forget the extent to which the constitution regulates our daily lives. If you were to pick up a newspaper on any given day, the front page is plastered with issues that either relate to or are directly governed by the constitution. Take for example the issues that are making the headlines today. Um, one issue in the, uh, in, in, on the front pages of every newspaper today uh, is about the Delhi riots case and how certain uh, academics and political activists have been implicated in that case. Uh, or another issue um, that has the media in a frenzy is the uh, Sushant Singh uh, Rajput uh, death uh, and the investigation surrounding it um, where uh, Riya Chakrabarti and others have been arrested and, uh, and other investigations are ongoing. Now in both these cases deal with criminal law and all of criminal law is governed by the constitution because criminal law uh, seeks to regulate our liberties. Right? What we can do, what we cannot do, what is what is allowed, what is prohibited, how can the state enforce that prohibition, when can the state deprive, of, uh, deprive us of our liberty in the enforcement of these uh, prohibitions. These are key concerns of the constitution and all of criminal law and criminal process is therefore governed by principles of the constitution. Or um, Take, for example, um, if, you, if you're talking about the Delhi riots, uh, the Delhi riots were um, in the background of the anti-CAA uh, protests. And uh, we saw uh, earlier this year uh, and late last year, earlier this year, that the protests against the, uh, uh, against the Citizenship Amendment Act were um, in the name of the constitution, right? That the idea that uh, the CAA was violating the constitution, both in terms of its text and the core principles of the constitution, and that it was um, it was a, a, a denial and a betrayal of, of what the constitution stands for. Uh, and so that is something that the constitution does. The constitution provides a site for protesting against the government of the day, whatever whatever government it is. We've seen uh, protests against previous governments. We've seen protests against the actions of this government. But it, but we, when we protest against the actions of the state, we, we often protest in the name of the constitution because the constitution governs every action of the state. The constitution is the supreme law of, of uh, the polity. And every action that the state takes and every law that the state passes has to comply with the constitution. If it doesn't, then it is invalid. So when we want to protest against the actions of the state or uh, against a particular law, we often do so in the name of the constitution. This right to protest, this right to voice our opinion against the, uh, the actions of the state is also protected by the constitution. So the constitution guarantees us liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, the right to free speech and expression, and the right to assemble peaceably. And these are ways in which we organize ourselves when we want to protest against the state. So then what is it that the constitution is doing? The constitution is a su the supreme law uh, of the land that, and every other action, every other state action, every other law has to be in compliance with the uh, constitution. And very importantly, the constitution is, places a limit on what the state can do. That is why we invoke the constitution when we want to protest against the actions of the state. We say that the state you, state, you cannot do something because the constitution prohibits you from doing it. Let's take another example. In, uh, it, there has been a lot of debate recently about the upcoming uh, parliamentary session. Uh, 
one level of debate is about whether parliament should be convening at all given the current pandemic and of course there are other debates about um, the the cancellation of the question hour and the cancellation of zero hour the constitution has something to say on when parliamentary sessions have to be held in article 85 the constitution says the president shall from time to time summon each house of parliament to meet at such time and such place as he thinks fit but six months shall not intervene between its last sitting in one session and the date appointed for its first sitting in the next session so you cannot have more than six months between two sessions of parliament be between the ending of the first session the, the prior session of parliament and the start of the next session of uh, parliament there are no exceptions to this that means that regardless of what the government of the day wants the, regardless of the wishes of the president or uh, any other official parliament has to meet parliament has to convene within six months and that gets over in the coming week that is why parliament will convene um, in this uh, time and this is the nature of constitutions this tells us something about what constitutions do constitutions place limits on what the state can or cannot do when the constitution says you have to do something the state has to do it when the constitution says you cannot do something the state cannot do it so the constitution is supreme law of the land all other laws have to uh, be in compliance with the constitution all other state actions have to be in compliance with the constitution and the constitution places limits on what the state can or cannot do those limits have to be complied with how do we enforce those limits the constitution also creates institutions and structures to distribute power in uh, power of the state and to provide checks and balances so for example the con the constitution creates uh, the architecture of state where there's an executive there's a legislature and there's the judiciary uh, the actions of the uh, of the executive are checked and balanced by the by the legislature and the judiciary the actions of parliament are uh, checked by the judiciary Right? So there is a system of checks and balances, a system of distribution and separation of powers and of checks and balances. And this is again something that the constitution does. It organizes, it creates the institutions of the state and it distributes powers um, within the uh, state. These keep keep these concepts in mind. The idea that uh, the constitution is the supreme law of the land, and the idea that the constitution places limits on what the state can or cannot do. These are themes that will uh, come up repeatedly in the course of this week, as well as uh, uh, our future lectures. Now, let's uh, let me take you briefly through the thinking process behind the framing of India's constitution. I'm sure we all know that the constitution came into force on the 26th of January, 1950. It's a day that we celebrate as a Republic day for that reason. The framing of the constitution actually predates independence. The constituent assembly started the task of framing India's constitution in 1946. And in 1947, when India gained independence, con the constituent assembly took over as the provisional parliament as well. So the constituent assembly started functioning both as the constituent assembly as well as the provisional parliament it took roughly three nearly three years a little bit uh, shy of uh, three years to frame the constitution and uh, this uh, this three year period was marked by intense public deliberation both within the constituent assembly and outside uh, on what the nature of this document should be like this charter for the future governance of the country what should it be like what should it contain what should it not contain this is this is an incredibly rich source of um, you know moral and po po political philosophical deliberation about the the nature of uh, nature of the indian experiment and uh, if you're interested you should on on any theme touching upon the constitution do look up as your first point of entry do look up the constituent assembly debates on that particular issue to see what was the thinking behind uh, behind put it, behind the design of the constitution in the way it was designed um 
so what were the key what was the key idea and understanding behind this constitution that's contained actually in the very first words of the constitution the preamble of the constitution the preamble itself draws from one of the first things that the constituent assembly got down to doing which was to draw up the objectives resolution um for for the constituent assembly the objectives resolution was uh, defined the aims behind the framing of the constitution and provided a, a blueprint uh, for for the design of this constitution so the objectives resolution said and the the eight points in the objectives res, uh, objectives resolution i'm just going to briefly highlight a few the objectives resolution proclaimed india as an independent sovereign republic and and the purpose of the constituent assembly was the objective of the constituent assembly was to draw up for her future governance a constitution so this is very important proclaiming india as a sovereign republic was important to break the tie from the colonial past that the constituent assembly drew its own its powers uh, from a sovereign republic as opposed to from the british parliament this was very this was this was an act of breakage from the colonial past and to buttress that the objectives resolution said that all power and authority of sovereign independent india its constituent powers and organs of government are derived from the people what does that mean derived from the people means that uh, the all power in in the indian polity resides in the people it does not reside in a monarch so it's not uh, india is not a monarchy it does not reside in a group of people india is not an oligarchy it de is derived from the people india is being constituted into a democracy and wherein shall be guaranteed and secured to all people of india justice social economic and political equality of status of opportunity and before the law freedom of thought expression belief faith worship vocation association and action subject to law and public morality these are the guarantees that structure how the the, the constitution has been framed and when adequate safeguards are provided for minorities backwards and tribal areas and depressed and other backward classes these are some of the key ideas animating the design of the indian constitution this is the framework this is the skeletal structure and the constituent assembly spent 3 years filling in that uh, skeletal structure and putting flesh on these bones the objectives resolution then goes on to shape the preamble of the indian constitution which says we the people of india right that we are the it is we the people of india who are giving ourselves this constitution so we are the repository of the sovereign power of the state all power in the in india derives from the people it does not derive from the british parliament it does not derive from the constituent assembly it does not derive from god it does not derive from any other source it is uh, derives from the people of india we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice social economic and political liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship equality of status and of opportunity and to promote amongst them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation in our constituent assembly this 26th day of november 1949 do hereby adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution so we the people of india are giving to ourselves this constitution now if you're familiar with the text of the constitution you might notice that there are some um, key words that are missing in this particular framing of the uh, preamble so the current preamble reads we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic the word socialist and secular were added by the 42nd amendment in 1946 now uh, this were these were uh, amendments made during the emergency and there has been some recent controversy on whether the fact that the original constitution did not contain the word secular means that india was not constituted as a secular um that the indian constitution is not secular 
in fact there was discussion on this in the constituent assembly it was very much the opposite uh, there was some discussion on including the word secular in uh, in the preamble and the reason why that was rejected was uh, because uh, the constitution was so self evidently secular that there was no need to put the word in um, right at the beginning uh, the other phrase that is missing from here again uh, is a later addition uh, is fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation uh, is something that comes in later. Now, liberty, equality, fraternity, of course, uh, derive their inspiration from the French Revolution, um, the, uh, the, the three core ideas of liberal, uh, liberalism that comes from the French Revolution. But the framers of the constitution added as the first ideal of, of this constitution justice, social, economic and political. And why is that? If you remember from uh, your uh, history lessons, the freedom struggle was not only aimed at uh, ending British rule. It was not just an anti-colonial struggle. It was also a struggle for social justice. It was a struggle to remove social inequities and inequalities in Indian society. And uh, the constitution framers thought that the Indian constitution should speak to and should address social uh, injustice, social questions of social justice and social injustice in Indian society as well. And that's very, very interesting because this is not something that uh, constitutions till that time were were supposed to be doing. Constitutions were supposed to create the charter for the state and to create the framework for organizing the state, not a framework for organizing society or not a framework, not, not providing a vision for what society should look like or for transforming society. The Indian constitution made a break in that sense from uh, the constitutions that had gone before uh, in saying that this constitution should speak not only to the organization of state, but to also to, the, to, to have a vision for the organization of society and the organization of, uh, of the economy uh, in order to provide for social, economic and political justice. And this is uh, uh, this uh, this aspect of the Indian Constitution then comes to shape constitutions that come subsequently in other parts of the uh, world. For example, the South African Constitution was heavily inspired by this ideal of um, of, of the Indian Constitution of having a vision for social transformation embedded in the in the, in the Constitution and many constitutions in what is considered to be the global south or the third world um, is are uh, that that have come subsequent to the Indian Constitution have uh, borrowed this aspect of uh, you know a social transformative constitution from the Indian Constitution. So justice, social, economic, and political was very, very key, key in the design of the Indian constitution. In fact, um, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, when he stood up to present the final constitution to the Constituent Assembly, he was, of course, the, um, the chairperson of the drafting committee. And in that capacity, he, uh, he rose to introduce the final constitution and uh, to, for its uh, adoption in the Constituent Assembly. Uh, and this is the, uh, he makes this uh, speech uh, giving an overview to the constitution and talking about his own impressions of the constitution and his worries about the future uh, and his hopes and aspirations for, for, the, for the future Indian state. And he says that on the 26th of January 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality, and in social and in economic life, we will have inequality. Right. So in politics, we have recognized uh, that one person holds one vote and one vote holds one value. We are all equal before the law. We are all equal um, in terms of the political value that we have. All offices are open to us. All offices of state are open to us. Um, and all, uh, all of us count as one and no one less than one. Um, but by reason of our economic and social structure, a social and economic structure, which is based on inequality, social inequality and economic inequality, we shall continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we live with this life of contradictions, he asks. How long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and economic life? Because if we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting our political democracy in peril. 
so therefore you cannot have the system of contradictions where in theory in in you know in a formal theoretical sense you recognize the val uh, the value of equality of all human beings but on in reality on the ground in your social structure in your economic structure there is no equality if you continue with a life of inequality this life of uh, contradictions uh, those who suffer from inequality will blow up the structure of political democracy on which which the constituent assembly had built up and so he therefore says that therefore this constitution speaks to not only political uh, inequality but also social and economic inequality and therefore the constitution is designed not only to address the political aspects of um, of the of the indian state but also the social and uh, economic life under the new constitution and that is why justice in all these spheres social political and economic are uh, are key design principles for the indian constitution so then what the constituent assembly goes on to do is it um, uh, it gives us the longest constitution in the uh, world by far the longest constitution in the world and the reason for the length of that constitution um, was that there was so much disagreement one of the reasons was there was so much disagreement on so many issues uh, that the framers felt that they should address and go into a uh, minutia of various issues that many other constitutions don't place on in the constitution they place uh, they uh, regulate those aspects through statutory law now what is the consequence of placing it in the constitution placing it in the constitution means that no other law can contradict that uh, those aspects of um, uh, th th those those laws so the one design choice that was made by uh, framers of the constitution was to have a very expansive constitution where many matters that other countries and other constitutions have relegated to uh, to parliament to decide uh, were actually put into the constitution itself so with that the indian constitution regulates a whole range of issues um that uh, that go on to govern us in our daily lives so uh, it regulates citizenship it guarantees us fundamental rights those include the right to equality to fundamental freedoms to uh, including the right to life to right to personal liberty uh, guarantees in the criminal justice process our freedom of uh, speech expression um, association assembly freedom of trade and occupation so on and so forth um the uh, right against exploitation the right to religious freedom certain cultural and educational uh, rights and the right to constitutional remedies it guarantees as an aspect of our fundamental rights the right directly to move the supreme court uh, for enforcement of our fundamental rights then it has a chapter on uh, the directive principles of state policy the directive principles of uh, state policy are guidance that the constituent assembly has given to the future state and says that these are principles that you should be bound by in governing governing the future country the governing the future polity these are the principles that should guide you in your economic policy in your social policy in your political policy so for example the idea that um, you know you should prevent inequalities and the um, and and the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few you should ensure that there are just and uh, fair working conditions for all uh, uh, all workers and that there is a fair living wage um the some that you might know uh, that are more controversial is uh, is that the constituent assembly uh, directed the uh, state to have a uniform civil uh, code uh, to um, have uh, you know to to make provisions for prohibition to make provisions for uh, prohibition on cow slaughter so uh, these are uh, these are directions that have been provided by the constituent assembly to the future state and with the admonition that that the state is bound by these principles but these principles are not judicially enforceable so one cannot go to the courts and say that you know the the state the actions of the state are in contradiction to the directive principles of state policy um but these these principles are nonetheless binding upon the state it's just that they cannot be enforced before the 
judiciary. The constitution through subsequent amendments also provides for fundamental duties. It creates the, uh, provides the architecture of the state. So uh, we've already discussed this. It separates powers between the executive, the legislature and the judiciary and also between uh, creates certain fourth branch institutions, accountability institutions that provide another measure of accountability and checks and balances upon the actions of other uh, branches. So the election commission, the CAG are examples of fourth branch accountability institutions. Uh, it distributes powers between the center and the states. Uh, it is a particular feature of the Indian constitution that this distribution of powers is asymmetric. The center has more powers than the uh, state. Um, through the 73rd and 74th amendments, uh, the constitution now also has a distribution of you know, federal powers to local self-government institutions, to panchayats and municipalities. The uh, constitution also provides for special provisions for certain states, certain districts, certain areas, tribal areas, autonomous areas, um, uh, certain states. Uh, Article 370 was an example of special provisions for Jammu and Kashmir, but there are many, many other states, the northeastern uh, states being an example, um, many, many other states that are governed by special uh, provisions. Article 371, um, A to uh, you know, A, B, C, D, E, there are multiple provisions that govern uh, the, that provide special provisions for different states in the country. Uh, it also, in terms of the architecture of the state, uh, creates uh, the administrative, the structure of the administrative state and the regulatory state, uh, provides for uh, the, the services, the bureaucracy, uh, and the principles that would apply to the bureaucracy, creates tribunals for um, resolution of some types of disputes, provides for uh, the freedom of trade and commerce, provides uh, for elections, how elections are to be conducted, uh, qualifications and disqualifications of uh, members, provides protections for certain classes, um, particularly scheduled caste, scheduled uh, tribes, creates commissions, the National Commission for Scheduled Caste, uh, for Scheduled Tribes, um, backward classes commissions to, uh, to uh, protect the interests of groups that have been historically marginalized. Uh, provides for the languages of the uh, of uh, of the union and and, and the states uh, has certain emergency uh, provisions and of course that those are the provisions using which the uh, the emergency the emergency of 1975 was imposed and then it provides for uh, its own amendment how can the constitution be amended this is something this is an issue that we will uh, take up in greater detail in subsequent lectures so let me conclude the session by asking you a question what then is the constitution if i were to ask you what is the constitution can you identify what the constitution is what where would you look i have taken you through broadly the table of contents of the text of the constitution that is only one part of the constitution the text of the the, the document that the constituent assembly prepared is one part of what comprises the constitution. On top of that are ju judicial decisions that have interpreted the constitution. There are a set of what are called constitutional conventions. These are practices that have gained that because of repeated uh, uh, observance have gained the, uh, the sanctity of law. So let me give you one example. If there is a hung parliament, and uh, no party has uh, no one party has majority who should the president call to upon to form the government there's nothing in the constitution no no tech no no um, specific express provision in the constitution which guides the president on what to do or what not to do in the situation so there are conventions that have developed around this for and the con conventions are that it, sh it is either the single uh, largest party or the single largest coalition depending on um, various permutations and combinations so these constitutional conventions because of their uh, because of them being followed uh, for for many many years with 
the with the belief that 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 the those who are following this these principles are also bound by them gain the status of constitutional conventions and there is an expectation that they will be followed courts use these principles to to decide whether there was a violation of the constitution or not so there's a written part of the constitution there are this, these unwritten parts of the constitution and then there is the the judicial decisions that again add another layer of uh, of flesh maybe a, probably a layer of fat on top of the uh, flesh that is the constitutional text so that is what the constitution is we will stop the lecture here and um, take up uh, the issues of uh, of what it is that constitutions do and how we should think about the constitution in the next lecture